<laughs> and all of a sudden, it hard cuts <laughs> to her covered in bubbles with just her head sticking out of the tub. And she goes, soothing. This Very is, wet. This is some of... This is some of that progress that Zaius was so scared of. <laughs> well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode three of Go Ape, where we discuss all five of the original Planet of the Apes movies. Well, and today we're going to be talking about Escape from the Planet of the Apes, uh, one that is either beloved by fans or totally reviled joining me once again is my guest oliver the ricketts oliver uh, it's monkey business let's go i just want to start by saying the fact that this movie exists is insane arthur p jacobs got a notice from the heads of 20th century fox after richard zanuck was fired and after this movie was released or after beneath the planet of the apes was released because that had a budget of 2.5 million dollars and made 19 million dollars back so still a huge hit he got a notice in the mail that said, and I quote, this is all it said, Apes Live, Sequel Required. <laughs> and so he gave was the task... Was that cut out from magazines? What? I, I, I don't know, but that was the telegram he got. And so Arthur P. Jacobs uh, went once again to Paul Dane, the writer of the previous movie. Paul Dane came up with the idea that the apes find Taylor's spaceship happen to fix it up just before the Earth is destroyed from the previous movie, and that flings them back in time. Naturally. Where, naturally, of course. So now they're here in 1973 Los Angeles. Uh, I personally think the movie should have taken place in New York, but whatever. I feel like every movie, though, where it's like, oh, they're going back in time and fish out of water thing, always New York City. Well, so, to, me, it makes, to me, it makes more sense why it should have been New York is just because the first movie takes place. Oh, well, yeah, the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty by New York. That's yep, that's why yep. I, I thought that, but you already said that you, you enjoyed the movie, but do you think this convoluted plan managed to work? I think this is actually a really inspired turn for this franchise, personally. Mm -hmm. Every beat in this movie does not work. Uh, there There's certainly some things that I would change, uh, but, but I actually think you get a lot of really cool human drama in this movie from just like we know where this is going and we also know how human beings are um so even the concept of zira and cornelius being in our time is a little concerning uh and, and they've picked two characters who we've talked about already we love these characters because yes. these performances are so strong and i think the movie really again it lives or dies with that the, the performances are as good as ever, and it does the Planet of the Apes thing where a silly, silly concept mm -hmm. becomes very serious and, like, real to you while you're living in this movie. I must say I, I, I agree with you. I, I remember when I was a child watching this movie for the first time. Uh, and finding out, oh, the apes are just with humans now? Oh, that's going to be boring. It's funny that you say as a child, I've seen this movie before, but like I said in high school, and I just think I'm in a different spot now. I don't really recall a lot about it from before watching this. So as an adult, I'm like, oh, now we're going to the real world? And, you know, my, my initial expectation was, am I going to be bored by this? Mm -hmm. And I really wasn't, man. Yes. That is that is the thing where where I I asked you at the very beginning, do you think this worked and this convoluted idea worked? And I say one hundred percent yes, it did. Uh, because I, even as a kid, I remember being like, oh, oh, this is funny. Oh, this is cute. Oh, that took a turn. It does get to be all these different flavors that the other two apes movies before this can't. You know what I mean? Because well, there is society that we know set up. There is fish out of water stuff set up. Because you have Zira and Cornelius as the main characters, you also, funny enough, uh, have some romance here. Well, I think that works much to the, to the film's benefit. And uh, that actually is a good segue into one reason why I think this movie works so well. And that is because it was directed by a man by the name Don Taylor who was an actor he and paul dane came together 
and were sitting down, and they quickly realized what this movie is. Don Taylor said this movie is a romance. It is a love story, and love stories are tragic. Because he didn't really like the idea of directing an apes movie, but once he grasped that, he suddenly decided, I'm going to treat this and give this my all. And I think his direction is what makes the movie work so well in terms of getting all these crazy pieces to kind of work together. Because you're right, this movie is multiple different flavors. It's a comedy at times. It's it's tragedy. Uh, it's a political drama at times. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a really... It's a hodgepodge of different things. And ironically, I think uh, the, the Paul Dane got inspired actually by Pierre Boulle's novel again, just inverted it. You know what's very cool? Um, just before we get off the, the topic of it, it being the hodgepodge that it is, is that not only do all those themes work together to make something coherent, which, I mean, making a good movie is incredibly difficult. Like, that mm-hmm. that's number one. Making right. a good movie for the third time in a franchise and your budget's been cut twice, that's even more difficult. And we're taking the concept and changing it this much. It's even more incredible that in this hodgepodge, we still have all of the themes that made people like Planet of the Apes. The religious yes. thing is still there. The man versus ape thing is still there. The fear of progress is ever present here. And you know what? Uh, even in through all of that, I don't think it ever loses sight of what we care about as an uh, as an audience, and that is Cornelius and Zira. Right. And it turns into such a good character-driven story. Uh, you literally, I'd say more so in this movie than any of the other apes movies, you really forget that they're wearing the ape makeup. 100%. And it's funny because when I was watching this back, like on the first movie, I'm like, why don't I recognize these masks more like in my brain? You know what I mean? Right. And the conclusion that I came to in the first movie is, well, it's consistent. It's around all these other things, but I think it works even better when they are not surrounded by other apes and they're surrounded by people. And I'm not sure why that is. I think what really sells me is that one Kim Hunter and the return of Roddy McDowell as Cornelius. Cornelius, these two just knew how to work that makeup. And right. Unbelievably expressive eyes. Unbelievably and now they're the leads. Eyes. Yes. And they carry the movie. They do an excellent job. To show you just how like into their characters they were, um, there's one scene, the hearing scene, you know, only when she lets me. Uh that that scene. Um Which is such a sweet, like funny I love that human thing to say and i love i love the concept of the scene being that like they're more human than we think they are and as you're watching it you're like oh they're more human than we think they are well you know? I, I i love that but during during that sequence um they had shot all of the stuff with them right so mm-hmm. the director said okay you guys can start getting out of makeup and they start getting out of makeup but they were still supposed to be there on the scene so that way they they could read their lines back to the other actors that are now being filmed, right. the reverse shots essentially, and they got about halfway through taking off their makeup when suddenly, both Kim Hunter and and Roddy McDowell looked at each other and said, "Stop taking off the makeup. We're still acting, and somehow without the makeup, I don't feel like my character anymore." That's that- funny too when we're talking also about. In the first episode, we talked about how the monkeys and the apes and the chimps all separated because they, they like, went with their tribes in real life when they were making the film. Yes, yeah. It's wild how into these characters these actors got. Like, how being in that makeup was, like, second skin to them. It became second skin to them, and it's really impressive. It it is. I, I think it's no easy feat being in that much makeup and trying to emote, let alone have dialogue and all that crap. And these two just, they make it look easy. Immensely enjoyable movie. I think this is the sequel that could. It shouldn't, but it could. <laughs> uh, it, this movie should not work at all, but it does. You know what's kind of cool is I watched these movies on Hulu this time around. Mm-hmm. Um, and Hulu, once you watch two of the same thing, they catch on like, oh, this guy likes Planet of the Apes. Um, and so when you go to the Hulu homepage, it goes like, here's a movie for comedy fans. Here's one for drama fans. Here's one for sci-fi fans. 
and every apes movie is in a different category like this That's one is funny. the drama then like one of them is like the comedy i think it's probably battle i i think it kind of speaks to all the different flavors that you get within this whole franchise and I think that's one of the coolest things about this movie that I wish franchises today could figure out how to do, which is here's a logical continuation of what we've done, but we're trying something different here. It, when I talk about Spider-Man on the channel, I talk all the time about how like I, I wish they could figure out not every Spider-Man movie needs to be the same, especially the villain movies. And they can be different genres, and that's still consistent with what we're doing. That takes a special kind of script, and it's very cool that this movie could do that. And I know, like, that's mainly the point that I've brought up, but it's not the only thing that I like about this movie, because this is just a legitimately good movie that you don't need knowledge of the other films to enjoy, in my opinion. It is a good standalone movie. It works on its own. This I mean, could they just make... be a movie about monkeys landing in in present day, and you space don't need monkeys. to know where they're from. Yeah. Yep, space monkeys. I mean, they make offhanded references to Taylor mm -hmm. and all of that, but it still works. Well, in in a standalone movie, the monkeys would still have background people from their yeah. life that they would know. It just so happens to be that that's from Planet of the Apes and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. We We talked so much about how crazy that ending of Beneath is. This is equally as crazy as that. Like, to, to even try this is equally as fucking nuts. You know what I mean? Oh, it's you mean just like the, the movie the movie itself? The fact yeah, that they're to be like, it? yeah, <laughs> we're going to bring two of the monkeys to 1973, and a lot of the movie is just going to be them in court and them going around town. Who's looking at that and saying, yeah, that'll work? Like all other Planet of the Apes movies, it seems, about halfway through this film, it There's takes a, a pretty turn. sharp, yeah, it takes a pretty sharp right turn. Yep. And it doesn't feel forced either. You know, it's, no. it's, 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 it's the, the previous film, it's jarring how fucking bizarre it gets all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. This Which film, admittedly no, is feels, part of the fun. I agree. I agree. This film, it's very natural. It's very natural because there's already that suspicion beforehand, particularly from a character right. named Dr. Hasline which is in itself a twist, because if you've been following the Planet of the Apes movies as it is, Dr. Hasline is the guy that sent up the original crew and sent out the rescue mission, so you think he'd be a good guy. He's a scientist, and it turns out he's not. <laughs> he's a piece of shit. Played amazingly by... Uh, who played him? Uh, he, he always plays a bad guy, or a not, uh, and usually a Nazi. Um, Eric Braden. Okay, word. I love Cornelius and Zira. Yeah. And they needed to be good for this film to work. And they're not just good, they're excellent. And right from the get-go, I love the sort of, the nuanced performances that, that they give because those two vets mm -hmm. first come in, Dr. Dixon and Steve something. Um, Cause she always called. I like Stevie. the idea that Steve doesn't have a last name. <laughs> But I love it how when they're kind of interrogating her because they don't know that she can speak yet. I love how if you watch in the background, you see Zira approach kind of curiously the two yep. vets. And if you look in the background, if you see what Cornelius does, you see Cornelius get up and he just casually sits closer to her. <laughs> and I'm like, this is brilliant direction because the camera's not focused on that at all, right? It's focused on Zira kind of approaching the two vets and then you just sort of see it in the background and I just love the fact that instead of staying back like a, a lesser director would have just had her had Cornelius sort of sit back but instead he makes he made the because you have to know that he had to have direction to do this Roddy McDowell or Cornelius gets up and just sits closer to Zira so that way if something happens to her he's right there you talk about recurring themes like we've talked in this series already about how not romantic and sexy they feel intimate the two of them right that feels like something that a real married couple would do i'm married if i see my wife about to get into a situation that i think might get hairy in public i would do the same 
thing. It's almost yeah. instinctual, and it's just something that develops when you're in a relationship for that long. Even people who are not in a relationship, I'm sure there are people who feel that about a lot of their friends and loved ones. Right. Uh, it, it's something that's very human nature natural, and maybe that's part of why these characters don't feel like people in rubber masks. Yes, I agree. I agree. They don't feel like people in rubber masks because of shit like this. You've got some amazing comedic timing. Robert, uh, Ryan McDowell has some really good comedic timing. I love the, 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 you have the army guy, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they're like, what do chimps eat? Well, I heard they like oranges. They like fruit. And so he starts handing them the fruit and he hands Cornelius two. And then Cornelius just sort of sits there and keeps watching. And without moving at all, suddenly he just holds his hand out one more time. Like there's three of us <laughs> and I, I love it. And then it just pans over and suddenly they're setting up plates and knives and everything and just eating them like people. And I'm like, this is funny. Okay. This is funny. Yeah. This movie's going to be going to have a little bit more comedy in it than the other two. Cause fucking a, the last movie he certainly had, had, had a many little either. grim and, and the intelligence test sequence. I love it. I love so the- that <laughs> that may be one of my favorite scenes in any apes movie. Well, I love the fact that Zira immediately picks up what they're doing because she's done the same damn thing to humans. She knows immediately what to do. She's totally toying with them. Like I love it how Doctor Dixon says a line where he goes, "Well, they can't be morons." And the moment she hears him say that, she looks back and she winks at Cornelius and then <laughs> <laughs> goes back. And I'm like, this is, and I love how Cornelius, it comes to this reverse shot of Cornelius. He just kind of sinks down in his, in his chair. It goes, Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> what is she going to do? One thing that I did mention in, in, in the first one with Cornelius and Zira. And I mention it here again because you just talked about it, the little tiny things where it's mm. not necessarily sexy romantic. It's just you've right. been with somebody a long time. Cornelius and Zira are always touching each other. Yep. They're always touching. From beginning to end, they, have, they are touching each other in some way. That's a note that I also think current day modern films, not just the apes films, but just blockbusters in general, they need to take notes from things like this. Every major movie that you see right now is completely sexless. And I'm not saying, oh, nobody's fucking. I'm saying <laughs> these people these people are not interested in human connection based around your sexuality. There's none of that. You I had look that at a Marvel movie. I have that with Star nothing. Wars. Nothing. All those people are friends. Oh, Star Wars big time. It's so sexless. And not in a sexy way. It's just it's just everyone feels so cold and clinical all the time. Well, yeah, human affection yeah. and like your your desire to be with people right. and be affectionate to people. That's part of what makes us human. So of course, a movie that is so dependent on us buying into that these apes are the next iteration of human. Of course, they get that right because that's part of what makes a real life human being right and i just blockbusters now got to do that including the new apes movies i agree i i I agree and and what really sold me in terms of they're always touching if you watch that trial scene that we kind of talked a little bit about earlier but if you watch them walk in and sit down they're holding hands yeah. Like the like the entire time they they they're reaching out and they're holding hands despite the fact that they are handcuffed and it really sells that these aren't just people playing like they love each other. They are a married couple. They are married. Right. Some of the writing in this movie, the dialogue, is superb. It's, and it's a very sharp movie. The one scene that I, I knew I fell in love with this movie during this scene, the president is played by a guy named William Wyndham, who mm-hmm. I know because he played uh, Captain Decker or Commodore Decker in uh, an episode of Star Trek, the original series called The Doomsday Machine, which is my favorite episode of Star Trek. Mm. And he's having this conversation with Dr. Hasline, and literally the concept of this conversation is Hasline is terrified that now that we know that Zira is pregnant, that that's going to breed a whole new race of apes. 
that are going to right. end up dominating us, which his fears are not unfounded. No, in fact, it's true. It is true. And but I love the dialogue in the scene because it, it could have easily have made the president just a one-dimensional character and Hasline a one-dimensional character for that matter. 100%. But I love the fact that the president says a couple of lines. He goes, so you tell me you would be for us sending somebody back in time to kill Hitler? And Hasline goes, yes. And then the president goes, ah, but would you be okay with killing him while he was still a child? And didn't. Is this the first instance of this hypothetical appearing on film? I wonder. It's got to be very close to the beginning because that is the one of the quintessential moral questions. I guess is one of the most evil human beings to ever live. But could you kill a child? Yes. Um, and, and and they're talking about abortion is what they're doing. They they want to sure. abort Zira's child, which for a '70s film, holy fuck, because that was a huge thing at that time. Abortion was really becoming a really hot topic issue the in the big country topic. around this time, because feminism mm. is kind of a theme in this film. Uh, you know, the previous one was like nuclear war and right wars that don't need to happen. This one's kind of a kind of feminism because Zira takes front stage on this. The fact that they're forcing her to get an abortion, and I love how the president says something really interesting. So you want me to destroy this baby in the womb so it doesn't destroy us later. And he says my favorite line in the film. He says, Herod tried that and Christ <laughs> survived. And I'm like, God damn, the dialogue in this movie is so good. It's There's so There's also that, good. that theme of religious manipulation mm -hmm. coming into play again. Yes. Um, but now we're seeing it more direct on what how we use it. And you're right. All of this dialogue is very sharp. This movie is much more of a thinker than you would expect from a movie about three apes getting out of a spaceship after they travel back in time. And now they're in 1976 Los Angeles, even though they're from yeah. several, several centuries before several or, or later. There's one part, too, I believe, where Hasline. The president asks Hasline, you know, what are you going to do? And I think Hasline genuinely says, I don't know. And he yeah. just sits there and thinks. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is this is good. No right to be that good. <laughs> uh, that was exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> that scene is preceded by a news anchor getting on and going, monkeys from space, yeah. they're here. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a spaceship manned by monkeys. The humor can come into play and know that the movie is over the top and then you can have scenes like that which are and i keep saying this word but they're profound what i love about this is that unlike the previous two films where almost everyone is really one-dimensional just the level of nuance with a lot of these characters particularly hasline hasline is the villain he is the villain, right. no ifs ands or buts but he's got a lot of nuance and one of them that i like right from the get-go in terms of how serious he's taking all of this, is that during that trial, during that hearing, everyone's laughing. Everyone's chuckling at some of the answers. The, the, the main judge goes, does the other one talk? And then Cornelius stands up and says, only when she lets me. Only when she lets me. And everyone starts laughing. And Hasline is instead completely floored. And because I love that. Because not only can they talk, they're... They're intelligent. Like They're us. very intelligent. And what I love about that too is that for the rest of that hearing, while everyone's kind of laughing and kind of confused, he is the only, he even says the line too. Uh, the judge goes, uh, he's not really a judge, he's the chairman. The chairman goes, but oh, that doesn't make any sense. And Hasline goes, it's the only thing that does. There is something that Cornelius says that I find interesting. Cornelius goes, chimps are pacifists. And that's certainly how the movie has played, the, the series has played chimps thus far. Especially but them. Yes. When in reality, it would have been the gorillas. The gorillas <laughs> would have been the pacifists and the chimps would have been like, no, we're going to kill everybody. Very violent animals, yeah. <laughs> I, love how, I love how racist Zira is, too. She's like, it was the gorillas' war. Bubbling buffoon gorillas. Not ours. <laughs> Not ours. <laughs> I love that Zira takes a turn to become a uh, uh, Long Island mom with her with her grape juice plus. <laughs> oh and my her god! Racism and her. 
Well, they don't know what alcohol is, too. That's what I find fascinating, is that the yeah. it's, it's inference here that the apes don't know what alcohol is drink. at all. And so, because of that, Hasseline knows that and totally gets... It's just, it's kind of disturbing how he just... He says one line, and you laughed at it. You you sent me a message, and you're like, any movie where a doctor says, hey, it's really good for the... Drinking is really good for the baby, too. <laughs> it's really good uh, for the baby. <laughs> See, I love that, because when you're watching it now in this time, you are thinking... Because is it before pregnant women stop drinking and we, we get wise to that? <laughs> or is it... Like, because uh, not knowing the moral character of Hasline until this scene, and knowing that things got a little crazy with pregnant women back then, oh, uh, yes. you could rip it, rip a heater and have a glass of wine just fine. That's the first scene where we actually get an inkling that Dr. Hasline is going He's to be at the, the very true least villain. manipulative. He's going to be yeah. the villain, is that particular scene. Because when he finds out she's pregnant, he wants to get to the bottom of it, and he blatantly lies to her. And I love the confrontation that eventually happens with Cornelius Zira, the interrogators, and Hasline. And you have Cornelius, that anger in Cornelius begins to show too. That that anger bites him in the ass later in the movie. Just as Zira, Zira's own vices, uh, she tends to be hot headed and she'll say stuff. Hence I loathe bananas. Because yep. I loathe yep. bananas. That's the whole thing that kicked all this off it ends up biting her in the ass later too. And th- I love how that's all set up, but I love there's one, Rodney McDowell gives a really good performance and he slams his fist on the table and he goes, man destroys man. Apes do not destroy apes. And that's the difference between your kind and mine. That scene also reveals a huge plot hole within the continuity. Uh huh. How did Cornelius and Zira learn of the secrets learn of the secret scrolls of the sacred scrolls of the apes past? The story of Aldo, which is a great scene. Yeah. It's a great performance. Aldo said no. I love that. It's great. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But that contradicts everything that, that we know we... about about this. <laughs> about about yeah. ape society from the past. And that made me go, huh. In the same era, Marvel is publishing uh, The Incredible Hulk, and Stan Lee is writing. He used to do Stan's soapbox. He would write into the editor, right. and he'd write back. And some weeks, The Incredible Hulk's name would be Bruce Banner, and some weeks, it would be Peter Banner. And people would write in and go, I thought his name was Bruce. And he'd legitimately write back, and it's crazy to think about now because comic books are all about continuity now. He'd go, yeah, we forgot. Didn't check. We we forgot. I think it's Sorry, a lot of, we'll get it next time. I think it's it's a lot of we just didn't care because that stuff didn't exist yet or like to the level right. of how well, much we, we, also... we scrutinize it. Because remember, television, which is the closest thing we can get to this in terms of movies, is television mm-hmm. all episodic because people were tuning right. in whenever. It had to always reset at the very ending. And you and you mentioned this in 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 one of the previous episodes of Go Ape. You said. Each movie kind of has it is it works as its own thing. It kind of works definitive as a definitive ending. ending, and this is no different. And I think yep. that's what uh, where a lot of that comes from. So personally, I don't have a problem with that because I mean, look at the freaking Godzilla, the Showa Godzilla movies. They're supposedly all take place in continuity with each other. How? How? But voila, here we go. But it, it, I just don't think they cared, and I think the writer just said this is really good and it is really good the dialogue yeah. is great and Roddy mcdowell gives an amazing performance ultimately forget continuity if you have strong material you know sure why yeah. why should something like the facts uh a little little saying i just picked up in ireland uh never let the truth get in the way of a good one the way how they drag cornelius out of there and how he's pleading don't take me away from her. And he's crying her name as they shut the door behind him. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's got wrenching. heartbreaking. It is. It's Terrible. completely heart. It's completely and, heartbreaking. And it's one of those situations that you can see yourself in. You feel the peril because that's most of our greatest fears is not to be dead or to be killed by a gorilla on a horse with a gun. 
it's being separated from our loved ones in a way that is out of our control. People are so in a completely alien environment. Control. Yeah. Completely alien environment. And to the extreme in this case. And I love how Zira is is terrified. But I also love how Dr. Lewis is the one that gives her the injection. And that mm. even when she, he is standing beside her, she's a little less scared with him. Yeah. And I love how she goes, I know exactly what this is. Because I've done, I've done it. it. Yep. Yes. And I love that. I love that so much. In fact, that entire scene I really like. Oh, the just... plot device of her being a scientist herself and mm-hmm. having basically done the same thing to the equivalent species in her time uh, really moves along a lot of the tension in this, I, I find. Because it's not the kind of horror that comes from, like, I don't know what this doctor's doing to me. It's the kind of horror that comes from, I know exactly what this is and I know what will happen to me and I can't stop it. Right. It turns Dr. Lewis into a better character, too. It gives him a lot of nuance because after he gives her the drug, he hates what he just did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely hates the fact that he did it because he's come to care for these two. He could leave. In fact, they say leave. Right. And he says, no, I'm going to stay. I know I'm saying that a lot, that I love that. But I genuinely think that's such a good a good character moment without there being too much character there. It's just him. It's, and it's so nuanced too. And it's not like flashy. It's not like it's a huge moment for his character. He just says, no, I am staying. Thank you. I'm here. What's cool is that these have gone from big spectacle blockbuster movies for the time to being little character driven pieces Mm -hmm. at this point. 100%. Um, And that's because we're budgeting down but it is the creativity that comes from being limited uh, where you get all of these wonderful moments from these actors and these characters that you wouldn't have in a bigger movie. Speaking of, of the character driven stuff, did you notice what snaps Zira out of her drugged state? She thinks of Cornelius. She says his name and that snaps her out. And suddenly she, she gives this most pitiful sound like she she says it the most pitiful way ever she just says cornelius and i'm getting like chills thinking about it i'm like oh it's so painful she's so scared you you completely forget these are people in eight makeup it's it's the kind of performance given through this heavy makeup that we don't see actors giving now as themselves right and then it's it's even better because it sort of accumulates in this one scene. That's the escape scene, you know, mm-hmm. um, where they're in. Cornelius realizes what they just did to her. Right. And he slams his fist down on a table and he's, and he's fuming. He's livid. And Zira is trying to kind of calm him down as, she, as she's laying there. And this is the first time you really see how pregnant she is, too. Mm-hmm. He sits down next to her after being so angry and so pissed at their situation at how they treated her suddenly he looks at her he picks up her hand and and he puts it to his face and he says very quietly they treated you like dirt and what is also cool is that we have not seen cornelius be very shaken at all um throughout this entire franchise he's pretty level-headed out of the two of them he's the more level-headed he's calm cool and collected so we've found something that is a trigger for him. Um, and now we know so much more about this character. And mm-hmm. we are sold even further on these are two people who are in love. This is a love story. Yeah, exactly. And of course, he doesn't mean to kill that guy either. I think that's a good a good distinction there too. He doesn't he doesn't it's like he doesn't know his own strength. He made a mistake. Yeah. He made, he a, made mistake a mistake and it's even more powerful because we are not accustomed to seeing Cornelius make a lot of mistakes. Right. Right. Well, they make several mistakes and and it's kind of a theme throughout this almost that they make these little tiny mistakes that add up, but not rage filled mistakes like that. No, not rage. Well, again, it's getting more towards the end Mm. is that scene. Right. And right. The first mistake they make is they talk. The second mistake is when Zira almost says, I dissected many humans yeah and she quickly adjusts it that's what triggers Hasline. that's the one that really comes back to bite them 
because mm-hmm. that's the one that, that gets one. on the tape. And then the last one that really fucks them over is Zira. In order to better hold her child, quote unquote, drops her handbag and leaves it there. And that's how the police and the National Guard and everybody discovers they're somewhere around here. Yeah. And it's all these little things, with the exception of that one big one, that add up and do them in. That ending is so tragic, partially oh because it's, it's not filmed very cinematically at all. And it, I, th- I, think, I think that's what makes it work. Absolutely. Because it's similar to the the fight that we were talking about between um, Taylor and um, Brent. What's his name? And Brent, it's just savage. It's Mm -hmm. animal. It's matter of fact. It's this is the cruel nature of this world. This is what happens to people in it. And this is what happens to them. And it's perhaps the saddest death because these two characters are not only at this point characters that we love but they're kind of a window in to someone with human emotions watching how this world works they are the most human feeling characters in the entire franchise i would agree in the entire franchise as well it's cornelius and zero and they are shot down like dogs they um not just them the baby is too thrown in the water well the hasline shoots the baby three times right before and, that. And, 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 and unceremoniously murdered. Yes. And also, I, I love how when, when Cornelius shoots Hasline, he's got a mm. squib, right? And there's, yep. there's blood. And it's not a ridiculous amount of blood, but there's enough there that it literally, and I don't know, I think his scream also adds to it too. But when Dr. Hasline is shot, that scream he gives before he falls into the water, it's gut yep. punching. It feels real. There's some of the blood hits the lens of the camera. It was a total accident, but it, like oh, it hit the lens of the like camera. That, man. Oh, it's so good. It's it was so good, and it, it really packs a punch. And, and you, you know what's fucking crazy about the whole thing is you really want to hate Hasline, but he's not fucking wrong. He's not wrong. He's not the... fucking wrong, and he has this speech that he gives that I just love, and it sums up why I think his why he's so dead set on this idea and he goes later is what i'm worried about later we'll do something about about pollution later we'll do something something about global warming we'll do something about population explosion later we'll do something about nuclear war we act like we have all the time in the world how much time does the world got someone has got to uh, someone has got to somebody has got to start to care and i love that i love that chilling Because that cuts to the core of what this movie even is. Sometimes you need to make a hard choice and be proactive about what's happening. And that's kind of like, I guess, what Apes is about, period, is how our hubris and our advancement eventually doomed us. But can you really afford to be afraid of progress? I don't know. know? Well, well, that's the genius of this. I love how the movie doesn't answer anything. No. It just it leads you to think about it. Ultimately it it kills Dr. Hasline. His obsession with this to try to to do the what he thinks is the right thing. It ultimately kills him. That's the end as well. The end to him. Yeah. Because it is it is a, a brutal ending, which is really funny because as gut punching as the ending is in the previous movie. Yeah. This one is so emotional. Absolutely. And so personal. Because there, there's something about... Zira throws the baby overboard so it could drown. Mm. Absolutely sealing the deal. Yeah. And we later learn to also hide the fact that she swapped the babies with Armando. That's not hers. Yeah. 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 It also... It's, it's double protecting her, her, her child, which I think is brilliant. What is her last act? It's to her... crawl to the dead to a dead Cornelius and hold him. And I'm like, God damn it. He's <laughs> p- 
hardcore <laughs> monkeys because it, it's a bigger gut punch than the last movie because the last movie a has the the crazy factor going for it it's where it's, i yeah i can't believe you did that and so in some ways the the seriousness of that ending is a little lost in that this is so nuts i have to digest that there's no humor to be found in this it's so and sad this the last one is like, well, this is just the course of events. If this happened, this would happen, and then this would happen. Uh, this one is heartbreaking. You're you're sad. You're you're desolate, broken over losing these characters. You really are, because now we've also had three movies with them. They've so been like, the only constant. I just wanted to mention Armando, played by Ricardo Montalban, another Star Trek uh, guy. He's, He's so much Khan. fun. He is just a okay. With hiding fugitive apes <laughs> in, in, in his circus, he and, and the line is not, so you want not just the, okay with it, he's excited. About he's excited it. about it, and I love how he's like. So you mean to tell me that you want to hide these fugitive apes with me? Well, I'm here to tell you one thousand percent yes. I say less, you son of a bitch. I'm in. You also mentioned the religious factor too. Armando has a, has a religious thing too. He gives his necklace to uh milo is what they decide mm -hmm. to name the child after after the ape that was with them in the beginning who gets killed mm -hmm. by a gorilla in a horrible horrible <laughs> like the worst ape costume i've ever fucking seen he was the it was like the emblem of like saint george or something like that and he was like he was the saint of to all animals and the fact that zira is giving birth to milo Gorilla in, Jesus. Well, yeah, and the fact that it's being done, chimpanzee Jesus, and it's being mm. done in a zoo. It's being done almost like a barn, you could say. Yep. Yeah. Some some might observe that. Uh, yeah, and I'm like, okay, this this is okay. I like this, and it's just it's subtle it's just enough. Just subtle enough that it doesn't hit you in the head. Yeah. Also, what's cool about the ending here is that I've been talking this whole time about definitive endings, and this ending is perhaps the most open-ended we could do a sequel that they did, which is, it's... of course, the baby ape speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but it also totally works as the last thing, because essentially this movie is a time loop, right? Yeah. That's the last piece of the time loop. Uh, from here, we know that time marches on, and the apes get smart and they take over and this is how it happens so this is still following that trend of this is the definitive ending of this franchise this could have been the last frame that ape talking i'm glad it wasn't because i love conquest but it easily could have been the last thing yeah and work just fine yeah you know it would have, it would have been a very definitive ending and worked just fine and i would have been very happy and content but at the same it, time, it doesn't close the door in quite the same way that the last one did. Yeah, Paul Dane specifically, I remember this, Paul Dane specifically wrote the ending this way because he knew they were going to call for another sequel if this movie was successful. And sure enough, it was. This movie had a $2 million budget, which is cheaper than the previous film. And mm -hmm. it had it made $12.5 million, million back. So that is still a huge profit. Yeah, especially uh, then. So guess what? We're making more ape movies. Here comes Conquest. It's it's around this time where people started going ape. Like, really going ape. Like, yep. people really are like, these movies, this is a phenomena. Marketing and, bonanza, uh, baby. I would actually, on a technical scale, I do think this is a better movie than Beneath the Planet of the Apes. It's just not my favorite. Beneath is my favorite. But on a technical <laughs> level... This is this is the A if Beneath is in is an A minus, but a, on an enjoyment level, Beneath is the A plus, and this is the A minus. Okay, I I just I understand why people kind of don't like this movie. I I understand because the two the two previous movies are so dark and so dead serious, and that's part of what makes it work. Suddenly you got this movie, and you have ape it's wearing nineteen seventies clothing. You have a Sex in the City montage where they discover this, the town of Los Angeles. I love the fucking scene where Cornelius comes out wearing a suit and tie. And Zira yep. just sort of looks at him googly-eyed. 
And then all of a sudden, he's sitting in the limo, waiting for her to get her thing. And when she comes out, suddenly she throws off her robe, revealing that dress that she's wearing. And I love how you see Cornelius put his hands to his mouth and then open his <laughs> arms. And I'm just like, that is, this is because so right here, corny. <laughs> Cornelius has finally learned the universal truth of the universe, which is women be shopping. Women be shopping. Right. I also love the bubble bath. Yeah. They clearly don't, they don't do that apparently in, in, in ape city because he goes, how is that? The society it, strikes me as a little too harsh for a bubble bath. And all of a sudden it hard cuts to her covered in bubbles. With just her head sticking out of the tub. And she goes, soothing. <laughs> this Very is, wet. This is, some of, this is some of that progress that Zaius was so scared of. <laughs> I fucking love this film. movie. I fucking what love this film. movie. I think, I think objectively this is, a, this is a much better movie than Beneath. Um, it's very cool that they made this. Uh, today, this type of movie is never happening. You know no. what I mean? No, it's never happening. It, the, well, I suppose it, I suppose it could, but it would. It just wouldn't pack that level of nuance that we see within it. And it, it certainly it would, would not be a hit. Well, it could be if you make it with a small enough budget. I think that's the key. Yeah, you'd have to a twenty four it. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or Blumhouse it. But yep. it's this is the sequel that could. It shouldn't exist, but here it is, and, yet, and here it's it great. Is. And largely forgotten, but if if you haven't, you should watch it. Yeah, this is, by the way, the second most popular of the original five films. For this, sure. This movie. Yeah. Yeah. And and I can see why, because it, it's also like a palette change. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I could see Apes and Beneath kind of blending together. But here's a definitive, nope, this is different. Yeah. Well, the first two definitely work as a continuation of the other. Yeah. Uh, warts and all. Um, and this movie definitely, it's the beginning of a new chapter. And, and I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. So <sighs> my God, we've only got two more to do Oliver. Only two more, only two more. And next we're going to be doing conquest for the planet of the apes, which you have not seen the unrated cut to that movie. No, I have not. I have you... not. Oh, I have to get on it. Um, shit. I guess if you want to pimp yourself out, because you pimp yourself out, now's the time to do it. Let's do it up. Oliver the Ricketts, uh, other productions and media on YouTube. Uh, Oliver the Ricketts on TikTok and Instagram and everywhere else. Uh, find me talking about little interesting curiosities from throughout my daily life, including extensive coverage on Fruit Brute and his monster cereal friends, among other topics. Uh, and if you're looking to hear me talk about movies... I do a lot of that over on the Designing Hollywood YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe, like, comment, all those things. I'm around. Um, I'm a menace. Well, uh, links to where you can subscribe to him and check him out uh, are in the description below, along with all of my social media. All my social media is indeed in the description below. Uh, and all I can say is stay tuned for next week where we dive into, I would argue, overall the darkest ape movie i i don't even think it's an argument i think a hundred percent the darkest most relevant to our time apes film and the most controversial too a hundred percent of the ape movies and why i fucking adore it all right we'll talk to you guys see you next week we'll go ape once again take so care long, kids <laughs>